the pits, where for every driver in the race, three mechanics have been turning wrenches for weeks, determined that their machine will be one that survives the grueling 600 miles. These are the unsung heroes, the men who make them go, the men who keep them together. Every part of every race car is as carefully attended as a newborn baby, for they know well that the tiniest detail, when overlooked, can lead to disaster. Every machine is checked and rechecked. There are special adjustments to be made for every track, special safety reinforcements that could mean the difference in life and death. Nothing is left undone, for these machines must bear more strain in a single afternoon than the average motorist would administer in five years of highway driving. There is no way to estimate the value of this careful preparation, but almost any driver will admit that top flight mechanic work is at least 50% of the game. The men who ride these iron steeds know that you can't win a horse race with a mule. Like the jungle itself, survival means sticking together. And so it is here with driver and pit crew. They pool their knowledge in an effort to arrive at answers. How fast? How many tires? How long on a tank full of gas? These are questions which must be answered now. For once the green flag falls, there is no turning back. As race time draws near, mechanics set up shop in the pits they will man for nearly six hours, ready for anything from a tire change to a major repair job. The cars are fueled and to conserve every possible drop of gasoline pushed to the starting line. The crowd has jammed its way into the speedway, and the free race show is in full swing. A colorful prelude to the action about to begin. Drums roll. Fans get comfortable in the stands. And finally, it is time. Drivers break up their free race meeting and move toward their machine. In an instant, 55 unmuffled engines roar to life and the starting field swings out onto the track for the parade lap. Leading the pack out of the fourth turn, as the cars pass the stands in review, are Richard Petty and Joe Weatherly, who earned their front row spots by winning 100-mile races the week before. All other starting positions were filled by one man running faster than another. The automobiles which qualified fastest are bunched at the front of the field. This is the longest lap of the race for the driver, when minds split nervously back over every detail of preparation and ahead to the long straightaways which invite speeds of 150 miles an hour and to the steep turns which invite, perhaps, disaster. There's no more time to wonder. The pace is quickening. Engines screaming louder. All eyes are on the flagman. And suddenly, the green flag is out. The race is on. And what is this? David Pearson, a brash young rookie whose 1961 Pontiac was the fastest qualifier in the field, has thrown caution to the wind and cut inside in a swirl of dust as he attempts to beat the leaders into the first turn. This was supposed to be a race, one with strategy. But the only thing these hard-charging Pontiac drivers seem to have on their mind is speed. Average speeds quickly rocket to 135 miles an hour as young Pearson in Pontiac number three and old Pro Weatherly in number eight fight furiously for the ten dollars which falls to the leader every lap. Their speeding cars are only inches apart as they battle through turns and down straightaways. And right behind, two more Pontiacs coming hard in third and fourth place veteran Marvin Pank and newcomer Ralph Earnhardt. These boys don't intend to be left out of the action either. and blasts into the lead. But the pace may be telling already. Rubber flies in the first turn as Junior Johnson's Pontiac blows a tire, kisses the fence, and heads for the pits. Here's another car out of it. It's Joe, the man who won last year's World 600 in big trouble.
he's out of his car and out of the race. The caution flag comes out to slow the field as Johnson's car is hauled away. The early leaders, sensing now that too much speed can be as costly as not enough, duck into the pits. Earnhardt gives up first place as mechanics give his car the once over. Tires must be replaced already. Pontiac number six is on its way again. Pearson, meanwhile, is still burning up the track, intent on keeping the lead as long as he possibly can. Behind him, the field is thinning out now. Many of the veterans are laying back, intent on surviving this early fury and racing later. But for some, misfortune strikes without warning. Tommy Irwin and Doug Yates angle at the pit road entrance. But when seconds count, it's a long way around to that pit road. Tommy Gonzalez gets into the act. Recovers and moves on. And now what of Pearson? He's been a long time without stopping. Here he is now, limping into the pits with one tire flat. You don't play it much closer than this. That tire flew as Pearson entered the pit road. One more lap on the track would have been one too many. Now, everything depends on how quickly Pearson can get out of the pits. Joe Weatherly is away, but Pearson is still in. for control. A tough break for Jarrett. He has to finish well in this race to stay in contention for the national championship. But now he has to pay in precious seconds for taking that one lap too many. puts Earnhardt out front again. But here's a familiar challenger. It's Dave Pearson, blasting by Fireball Roberts, squeezing by Earnhardt, and pouring it on for all he's worth to nail down that number one position. While the old pros stick it to slower paces, Pearson is still hammering away at 135 miles an hour. How long can it last? How long can man or machine survive? Marvin Panch is in trouble. Two tires exploded under Panch as he roared into the fourth turn at better than 130. His 500-foot slide almost ended in tragedy as Larry Flank, a relief driver in Curtis Turner's Ford, plowed into him broadside, sending Panch into a wild spin and Frank skimming across the grass apron. Two more machines have failed to survive. The drivers are shaken, but unhurt, and the battle rages on. A scream of smoke bursts from Buck Baker's car as it whirls into the first turn. Baker is immediately called into the pits. His mechanics await anxiously. The smoke is a bad sign. This is all for old warhorse Baker. The strain is showing, now along pit road. Most pre-race tragedy outlined five stops over the 600 miles, but the unforeseen has already cut into the plans of many. Now the stops must be even faster to make up time that has been lost.
green flag fell, Richard Petty's Plymouth is out front. Here's a pace that is paying dividends. Buddy Baker's bicycle crosses up in front of Joe Weatherly. Joe tries to straighten him out, but it's no use. Now it's Roy Tyner hanging on in the first turn. And on to the pits. There's that telltale smoke again. This time it's Tim Flock's Ford. are getting hot for Richard Petty, too. Ned Jarrett in number 11 and Dave Pearson in number 3 are hungry for that lead again. And Pearson takes over as Petty ducks into the pits. She's slow starting. Something may be wrong under that hood. But at last, he's away again. These men have been flirting with tragedy all day. Now it has struck. 20 feet of steel guardrail ripped through Reds Cagle's car as he crashed the fence. This is the price that fate demands of those who gamble at high speeds and lose. Cagle paid with an automobile and a leg. The caution flag is out, and the field creeps around the track at less than 50 miles an hour as work crews repair the rail. But almost as soon as they return, so does trouble. Doc Reitzel takes the low route for the first turn. All eyes. Well, nearly all eyes. Are on the track as Bobby Reitzel follows suit in the second turn. Only two drivers are in the lead lap now, Pearson and Petty. And the way these two are flying, there doesn't seem to be enough room for both. Pearson is still clicking off laps at a tarred 135. But stopwatches show that Petty is going even faster. He's gaining on Pearson.
less than 40 seconds. But Richard Petty is in command now, and he likes the way it feels out front. There goes Friday Hassler. And the oncoming traffic threads its way by. the track at more than 136 miles an hour. He's far ahead of everybody, except Pearson, who is also standing on the throttle in an effort to keep up Petty's blistering pace. But what's this? The Petty Plymouth glides off the track and points its nose toward the pits. This is an unscheduled stop. Something has gone wrong for Richard Petty, and his pit crew knows it. The car stops, and Petty climbs out. It's no use, a valiant effort in vain. Car number 43 goes behind the wall. $30,000 goes out the window. And when it happens like this, it hurts. There goes Banjo Matthews. It's been a long day, and things are happening fast now. There's another car in trouble. Bob Burdick's Pontiac, with Larry Frank at the wheel, sends cars spinning in the first turn. It looked bad, but Frank is able to walk away. Good machines, as well as bad, are falling by the wayside now. Those which survive must have everything working for them. Now it would seem Pearson has it all to himself. His nearest challenger, Fireball Roberts, is two full laps behind. Pontiac number 22 has had its troubles today, but this is a brilliant driver and a first-class machine. Through no accident, Roberts has survived and now hangs grimly to second place. But number 22 slows. Roberts is into the pits again. It's a quick one. That tire was slowly going flat and had to come off. But now he's gone again, and the crowd tenses at the sight of Fireball Roberts, returning fully prepared to make his bid in the stretch. Time is running out now, and no matter how fast Roberts turns the track, he is too far behind to catch Pearson, unless something goes wrong with Pontiac number three. No one is more aware of this than Pearson's mechanic, Ray Fox. Fox intends to play the percentages. He gives Pearson the sign to play it smart. charges after him, still hoping for the break he must get to win. But it's almost over. Pearson zooms out of the second turn, on his way to the white flag. And suddenly, something does happen. Rubber goes flying as Pearson's right rear tire blows on the backstretch. There's no time to stop. It's all or nothing at all. Pearson has got to get that Pontiac under the white flag and then clear around the mile and a half track again with nothing but hot, battered metal holding up the right rear side of his car, limiting his speed to a mere 40 miles an hour. He gets the white flag at last, but meanwhile, Roberts is pouring it on. 
coming almost a hundred miles an hour faster in a furious attempt to beat Pearson's crippled car to the checkered flag. For Pearson's pit crew, every second is torture, but they can only pray. Don't stop. Please, don't stop. as he struggles down the home stretch a final time, takes the checkered flag. What a race. What a day for David Pearson and mechanic Ray Fox. Today, Theirs was the combination that paid off in cold cash and glory. For others, the day did not end so well. There were far more frowns than smiles, much more disappointment than success. But it was a fair fight. The rules were the same for every man. This was survival of the fittest. This is why the people come, to see the spectacular slice of life that is the world's longest, richest stock car race the World 600.